Okay, welcome to uh, today's LinkedIn Live. Thank you for joining us on a Friday, wherever you are. I see there's some people that will be joining us from uh, quite around the world, so that's fantastic. Thanks all for, for joining joining us. We've got uh, Elizabeth Harron as our special guest today. Um, Elizabeth will be talking to us about uh, a lot about project management, what goes wrong, uh, how to overcome those challenges. So I won't keep you a moment. I'm just going to let a couple of people come online so you can do that. We've got, um, uh, you can add in the comment section any questions that you have today or any thoughts. So please, as we go through this, um, please add your comments. Um, this will be recorded at the end and we'll be able to send this out to you. So if you're keen on that, you'll see a link in the LinkedIn Live at the end of this. So um, without further ado, um, let's bring Elizabeth into the call. Elizabeth, thanks for joining me. Thank you very much for having me. I'm delighted to be here today. Fantastic. Well, Elizabeth, perhaps before we start, if it's okay with you, um, just for a couple of minutes, maybe perhaps give people a bit of a backstory of your, of your, you know, your 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 world of uh, work, particularly within project management. But why don't you give us a whirlwind tour, if that's okay? Okay. Well, I know lots of people fall into project management as a second career or later on as kind of an accidental project manager role, and that is not me. I um, didn't know what I wanted to do when I left university. So I joined a graduate training scheme and got the opportunity to test out lots of different parts of a big corporate company and um, found one of the departments was project management and got placed in there. And then suddenly a light bulb went off going, this is a job that means I can help people get things done. I can create lists. I can tick stuff off. I can all the kind of things that I was naturally doing to be organized. And um, I thought, well, this is what I want to do in my life, just be a project manager. And I had no idea the job even existed. So I've worked in project management for maybe just over 20 years, probably. Wow. And um, up until about 18 months ago, I was in the, co the corporate world. I've managed projects here and also in France and um, well I lived in France for a bit for healthcare, IT, financial services, business change, transformation projects, that kind of thing and now I help project managers get unstuck with some of the more tricky aspects of what it's like to work as a project manager in the real world. So we take some of the things that people learn on their um, formal training courses and help people apply them to the real life challenges that they face, which is, I guess, what we're talking about today, really. Absolutely. And, you know, there's some some fantastic people who have joined uh, the LinkedIn Live, um, you know, who are project managers across multiple industries, um, probably many, many stretched on resources at the moment, um, mm. suffering from, you know, Zoom or, or Teams fatigue, you know, juggling family and personal life, trying to deliver projects under pressure of budgets, the business keep changing the, the requirements, uh, all that fun stuff. So why don't we just start off, if it's okay with you, Elizabeth, and ask you that question. You know, that first question is why so many projects do end up failing? Well, if you read a lot of the research, there's some common threads. But if you asked any project manager, and in, in fact, this would be a great thing to put in the comments. So if you're watching, drop in the comments why you think projects fail, because there are so many different reasons. Um, for me, I think it's often lack of executive leadership and poor leadership in the in the beginning. Then things like poor risk management because you didn't see risks coming or you weren't prepared to accept the fact that there were risks. Mm -hmm. That can really help. And then, oh, so so, so many things. This is a whole a whole book in itself. In fact, whole books have been written about project success failures. There's a really good one that I've got on the shelf down there. Um, so poor project management practices not following standard best practices, um, trying to do things where you are not following processes, which means you're not managing change effectively, poor estimating. So your projects go over scope and over budget and take too long Yeah. because of all of that. Then they cost too much and then somebody loses the will to continue working on them. And often I think projects fail because we don't define what success looks like. I think this is, for me, this is my fundamental reason that I see projects not be judged as a success and it's because nobody bothered to take the time to look at what does success really mean and it could be delivering on time it could be delivering on budget which is tends to be time cost and quality tend to be the things that formal project management instructs us to think about when we're talking to when um, talking mm -hmm. to users about what does success look like but actually it could be customer satisfaction or it could be that we just want them to build the most beautiful building in the world and we want it to be a landmark something like the sydney opera house would fall into that category a project that 
during its during the time it was created um, was quite challenging for many people. But now, what would Sydney look like if it didn't have the Opera House? I mean, it's it's a it's a landmark. I can see someone's put in the chat poor requirements capture. Yes, if you don't know what you're doing, then you yeah. need to make sure that you are using a project management approach that allows for that. And if you do poor requirements capture, but you're using a very strict waterfall approach, for example, you're going to end up delivering something that's rubbish. And then it will be judged as a failure because it's not fit for purpose. So lots of things, poor scoping, poor communication, lack of adequate testing. So you're not actually checking what you're doing is fit for purpose, not tailoring your solution. So you put loads of bureaucracy in. I mean, this, there's lots of different reasons, but if, if it comes down to to a couple of things, I'd say not understanding what success looks like in the first place and lack of leadership and lack of willingness from executives to make brave decisions about what they actually want to do with the project. I think that's that 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 one is also a great point because you see so many projects uh, trundle on when actually maybe they should either start again or scrap it, as you say, which we'll come on to later. So how, so how can people spot those weakest links within those projects, you know, and, and what can they do about it? And you know, you've mentioned a lot of things there on why they fail. So what are the perhaps the weakest parts of the, the, the links there and, and perhaps how can they be overcome? OK, <laughs> I can see your nearest just put lack of communication as well. That's a really a key one um, because that's one of the things that is a real red flag for me. If you are wondering, you know, you said, what are those red flags? What are those weak links? Mm. Lack of communication would be definitely up there because if nobody seems to know what's needed, or teams aren't talking to each other, people are doing the same work, but two teams are actually doing the same work. So there's duplication of effort. All of that stuff is a communication issue. Part of it is a communication issue. Um, so I would say that lack of communication and people not knowing what they should be doing is a big red flag and something that we can look for. Another pointer would be having an unrealistic project schedule. So someone's created a timeline just by themselves. <laughs> or hasn't listened to any of their executive, you know, subject matter expert input and has created a schedule. And then you're trying to actually deliver to that schedule. You can just look mm -hmm. around the room or test the room with, with Zoom, and get a feeling for how people feel, whether it's achievable or not. And you'll, if you get a sense that the schedule is not achievable and people are like, oh, I didn't sign up for this, we'll never do it. That's a big red flag that this project is heading for failure as well. Let's just just go back to that lack of communication a second. Sorry, you wanted to say. No, no go on. Oh, I could well, talk about this subject for hours, but. <laughs> well, well, let's well, let's just drill down on that and just ask. Well, well, how do you overcome that? Because it's all, it's very easy to blame other people within the organisation for that lack of communication. Uh, so, so who should own it, and how how can you overcome it? Well, the project manager should own it. The issue with lack of communication is. It could be a various various different things causing that. So I would look at what is the root cause for there not being enough communication. Is it that we don't know what we're communicating? So therefore we're communicating nothing. And that's always a risk because if you don't tell people anything, they tend to fill in the gaps themselves with what they think is the right answer. And that's often not really where you want people to go. So they might be making assumptions, they might be assuming the wrong things, or they might be just guessing what you want them to do. So it might be that we're not communicating because we don't know enough and that's a problem that we can fix by just telling people we don't know enough yet to tell you anymore and I'll tell you yep. when I know. Or it could be that there's just a fundamental issue with how communication works within the team in that let's say the project manager is a huge fan of Slack and does everything in Slack and yet they're working with an international team half of whom don't have Slack or don't have reliable enough internet connection to be on an online tool all the time so they're missing messages. So there could be an issue with how the communication is happening and the project yeah. manager not tailoring appropriately to make sure the messages are getting across to the team. Um, what else could it be? It could also just be that they just, hopefully this doesn't happen very often, but I have seen situations where project managers feel like they need to be the conduit for all information and everything has to run through them because it's a position, it's a position of power. It's a leadership role to be a project manager. and But that doesn't mean that you have to have everything run through you. And if you can delegate some of the communication streams and trust your team to talk to each other, then you can actually make the communication much more effective. Mm. Does that answer the question? That's brilliant. Well, we had, a, we had a good one here from Lisa as well, who said leadership's team sometimes won't accept that things can, can't be completed as quickly as they want them to be. So that's a, that's, that's a great point as well. 
so again how can you not not overcome it but how can you work with uh managing their expectations uh, from the business but also ensuring that they it's not over promised and under delivered i find it helps to give people data understand what your executives want and then try to make sure that you're meeting that in terms of their communication needs so some people will want a lot of information some people will want high level some people want data some people want pictures you know you, you can tailor your communication to fit the person who's receiving it and that yeah. will help you get the message understood and then the message could be we can do this by this day or we could do this by this day so if we add in more people you can have everything if you add in um, more time you can have everything if you give me more money we can have everything but if we're going to have this much time we need this much money and two extra people to hit the scope and present it as a juggling act with recommendations admittedly sometimes you will always hit a manager who says no just do it and I did early on in my career I did have a manager like that and we'd say oh but we need time to think and consider and he'd go no how hard can it be just do it and actually in many cases he pushed us to come up with innovative solutions and we could find a way to deliver at least something that met the requirement. So maybe it's doing a minimum viable product and then introducing more functionality and scope later on. There, there could be a number of different ways to solve the problem. If someone is, is just wanting something quickly, um, I think that that's, you want to push back to say, why? What is it about that date? Because some projects do have fixed dates and you just have to live with that and do as much as you can by the, um, by the time that has to go the project has to go live we're going to come on to um techniques for managing people on a struggling project in a minute i did i just see that robert's brought up a good comment actually um there you go there you go nice so, so it's a shame we can't do like well yeah, actually i think we can pull people in we'll have to try that next time elizabeth we'll uh, we'll do a bit of fun but delegating communication has been a source of potential uh, project scope change as a pm i need to remember to set that clear boundaries and expectations to help manage that mm. I think a lot of, I say this a lot, um, but project managers just need to be more brave. I think often organizations don't always set us up for success either, because there's often an, an expectation that the project manager is an admin role and that you just tick, tick off tasks, fill in a project log, take minutes in meetings and do things like that. So the more we can elevate our um, behavior and our leadership skills and become that trusted business partner, the more we will be taken seriously and the easier it will be to set boundaries and expectations like Robert said in that message there yeah we'll come back to, to Nancy's comment in a minute I'll just just move on to techniques for managing people struggling on a project I mean you've obviously seen that happen you probably get a lot of feedback on that uh, yes I would say be kind <laughs> I mean, the thing with a struggling project having worked on some myself is that you you're tempted to take it personally because the project is going wrong and the personal career implications for that can be significant because you don't want to be associated with something that's a failure. So there's a way of dealing with people that is still empathetic and kind and can be done without coming in and as a leader saying, you've done all of this wrong, everything you've done so far has been a waste of time. Now I'm coming in and I'm the hero and I'm going to save the project. So it's mm. very important, I think, to, to pitch that correctly and respect the fact that people have done their best because I don't know anybody who has ever turned up to work and sat there and gone, ha ha, I'm going to do the worst possible job I can today and I'm going to mess up as much as possible. People normally come at things from a position of trying to do their best with what they've got and yeah. for whatever reason, it hasn't happened. So I would say empathy and kindness is a good way to start and then start to unpick what's going wrong and how they feel about it and that can give you some huge insights into some of the fundamental root causes for why the project is is, um, I was going to say something not very polite there, so I'm trying to think of another word. The project is is not progressing as it should. We, we, you know, we've I've had many guests on the last few weeks, and people just the the market talk, talking to the market. Clearly, obviously, people are at home; they're they're not able to have an engagement in the same way that they would on a normal project when they were perhaps working in an office or at least seeing people more more again what 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 tips and advice would you give people to be able to have those kind of conversations when they probably don't have a, enough time to juggle it with everything else they've got to do to deliver a project i think it's finding some time and i know that's difficult but so much of project management is communication so the more we talk the more we can open up those bound those barriers between people and trying to bring people together 
it helps us make sure people know what it is that they need to do, helps us deal with some of the issues around managing expectations, helps us answer mm. questions about unrealistic schedules and all that kind of stuff. So sometimes at the moment, I would have, you know, let me rephrase. If you'd asked me that question two years ago, I would have said, get on a Zoom call, share video, connect. Now I would actually say, just ring someone on their actual phone, get them away from their desk, let them go and yeah. walk around the garden and, and chat to you and have a human conversation the old fashioned way. And that, that can be just as equally powerful as getting five or six people in a project team together on a Zoom call or doing a live video conference. You kind of touched on this a little bit earlier, but I'll bring it up because um, Nancy posed a great question about this unrealistic schedules. So, so again, I know it was around communication, but how, how do you how do you overcome that? And uh, again, what's the things that you can bring that to make it more manageable uh, for everyone? Well, I think it very much depends on how the unrealistic schedule was put together in the first place. And was it your your fault? <laughs> did, did you make it up yourself without any input from anyone else? In which case, you need to eat a little bit of humble pie, go back to basics mm. and start replanning with expert input about how long this work is going to take. But it might actually happen that something's changed on the project. The scope has changed, the, um, the boundaries have changed, and suddenly it does look unrealistic for whatever reason. And that is a case of going through the change control process, what's new, what's different, how are we going to hit this date? Oh, look, we can't. OK, can we replan to take longer? No, we can't. OK, so how are we going to address that? Maybe we could crash the schedule, add more resources, take some stuff out of scope, spend more money, whatever it is, um, so that you can try to uh, to hit that. But it has to be a collaborative effort. I think some, uh, certainly I was guilty of this early on in my career, is I might, uh, might have talked to people but then I would go away and sit with my Microsoft project plan and put all the, the tasks in and then present it back as if it was a done deal. And mm. often that's a really bad way of planning. It does take time to plan collaboratively and to get input from everybody. But that's part of the project manager's planning process, isn't it? To try to make sure that everybody is signed up and bought into what they need to do. Otherwise, they just won't do it because people are too busy to do something that isn't really, um, that isn't really helping them be set up for success. Thank you, Nancy, for that one as well. And um, so let's let's talk about managing leadership and stakeholders. What, why, is, why is that important? Sounds a silly question, but why is it important and what can people do to improve it? I just I've just written a book about this, Engaging Stakeholders, so I could talk about this all day. Um, why is it important? Because people get projects done. I mean, if you go to a project management training course, you'll learn some processes and you'll create some documents and all that kind of stuff. But it's the people who will actually be doing the work. So if they don't know what to do, if they don't care enough about it, if they don't like you or trust you, they just, well, they might do their work begrudgingly, but you will find that you are working with happier, more engaged people who are more willing to put themselves out when things go wrong, because that's likely to happen as well. Yeah. If you, you talk to them, and I, I think the word engage is such a buzzword, but it's basically making people feel like they want to contribute to the project without having to force them to take part <laughs> without yeah. having to say it's your job your line managers told me that you're working on this project and this needs to be done by friday so it's trying to create a collaborative communicative supportive environment where everyone can do their best work and enjoy it because <clears> we <throat> spend so much time at work why would you not want it to be a nice place to be so you, elizabeth just, just as an example you've been parachuted into a, a, a project you've been told it's failing uh, everyone's on, on, on Teams and Zoom. Uh, you can't get hold of stakeholders uh, easily. You've just you've just been given a directory and uh, a Teams list of who to go and talk to. Uh, how do you start building those relationships to overcome those issues? What do you, what do you do as a project manager? Start ringing. Start ringing round. And if you can't get hold of the actual individuals, you can go to their executive assistants. You can ask yeah. other stakeholders who else you should be involved in the project. And th there's a fantastic opportunity the first two or three months on a project or in a new role for you to ask all of the stupid questions. I know there's no such thing as a stupid question, but you yeah. can ask all of those basic beginning questions. that even if you feel you know the answer to, it's always worth getting clarification on and just listening to people talk about what do you think is going wrong on the project? How did we get in this situation? What could I do to make it better? What could you do to make it better if you had the time, the money, the support, the tools to be able to do your best work and then just listen and try to tr try to do something small for each of those people so trust is built through lots of sharing of small confidences and through delivering on your promises so if you can tell someone that you can 
help them with a particular problem or send them a document or template that will make their life easier. If there's anything in your power that you can do, you'll start to build those relationships through sharing those small wins with each other. Mm. That's great advice there. And, and you know, so many, so just, just going back to basics almost and doing that fact finding work, isn't it? Um, and, and building yes. out those new relationships. Because it, it, it could have been that the, the, there, was, there was issues previously that were, that were just uh, uh, unknown because no one, no one spent the time to find out. We, we, exactly. you've, touched a, yeah, you've touched on a few things there, but let's talk about those actionable steps for recovery. What's, what's, the, what's the major things people can do to, to, to take action for that recovery on a program that's, that's perhaps fa failing or failed? Well, every project is different and every turnaround is going to be different, but there are some common things that you can do. And it starts with talking to the client or talking to your project sponsor and finding mm -hmm. out how they think it's going. Do they agree yeah. with the perception that it's failing? And also being honest with them about what you found or that you know you, you believe that this project is in trouble. And it's not going to be an easy conversation because telling someone that their pet project or something that they've been sponsoring, basically they've let it go down the toilet. Um, through perhaps not having enough governance or perhaps not having the right team or whatever. But it's really important to be honest. If something's not going well, there's no point in covering it up because it's going to come out at some point when they don't get the end result that they're expecting. So we might as well have that honest conversation and be clear. Are they going to get what they asked for? Are they going to get it when they asked for it? How much of their budget is going to be wasted on this because we can't recover certain bits of the work that have already been completed? Absolutely. Or that we've done work that needs to be wasted. So... I think it's important to be honest and upfront. That's the first step. Talk to the person who is sponsoring the project. Let them know that you're on the case and talk them through some of the steps that you are going to be taking in order to bring the project back under control. Yeah, uh, you know, how, how, how many, a lot of, I, I hear this is a lot slightly going off tangent now, but I hear it a lot where, where people struggle, where they, you know, they've got multiple projects to deliver, you know, and, and, and it's understanding who you know multiple stakeholders are, are saying it's priority how do you prioritize when you've got multiple stakeholders are all saying it's it's important and how do you perhaps push back on that to the to the customer Oh, Elizabeth, I, I might I might have just lost your sound there. Oh, is that better? Oh, you might have to you might have to say that again because unless we've got some people who are lip Good readers. Lip reading. Right. So so I'll, <laughs> Sorry. I'll start the, I'll start the question again just in case. It was um, oh yeah, so you're juggling multiple projects, you've got multiple stakeholders who are all chasing you. Um, many people are in this situation, I know, because I talk to them every day. How do you overcome that? What do you do? Well, this is a really good question because I'm wrapping up teaching a course on managing multiple projects next week. And so the students have been asking this for the last five weeks um, because everybody's, lots of people are in this situation, as you just said. Most project yeah. managers these days run two to five projects, sometimes more. And mm. the thing that you said there about everybody saying their project is a priority is what's underpinning the problem because it's mm. not true. If you have PMO processes that prioritize projects or different managers who are telling you that things are important, that's a really good starting point is what is actually the priority order of this work. And you can do that in lots of different ways. Hopefully there'll be a PMO prioritization process that will tell you the order of priority of the projects, or you could mm -hmm. get the managers together, or you can have conversations with your boss saying, you've asked me to manage this piece of work, so I can do that, but it means that one of these two pieces has to stop. Which one do you prefer me to stop right now? And mm. if nobody comes up with any suggestion or you just get this kind of poor leadership now they're all important, just do it all. Then you have yeah. to make the decision and you have to prioritize. And then I would be blocking out time in my calendar to do to spend more time on the projects I deem to be the priority and less time on the projects that are not. So I'm time blocking. And then that way everything moves forward a small bit based on the priority that has been allocated to it. I mean, there's, there's lots more we could go into on that, but that's pretty much a, a strategy that people can try. What's what is is this one of the you know that's obviously a big topic for you that people are asking you questions about. Is there any other things that you're seeing that, that is the pain points for project managers right now at, at, at today's point? 
right now today i think it's the engaging with people virtually virtual leadership virtual meetings how do you do a two-day requirements gathering workshop when you've only got zoom so it's it's that change of working style mm. and navigating that and the juggling uh, multiple projects mm. as well seems to be big yeah. and the, the fact that because i suppose so many people have been on furlough or who've lost their jobs they've um they've, they've got to a point almost where the resources are really stretched and yeah. people are just giving them more and more work everybody has seems to be working at full pace for some time now and mm. i think there's a risk that we will see people leaving project management because of burnout that's huge <laughs> Yes, absolutely. Well, are we going to? I mean, obviously, different jurisdictions around the world of different different things. Are we going to? Are we going to see a lot of people having some time off in the summer this year, and uh, projects might slow down? Uh, what, what do you think? <laughs> well, when I worked in France, projects slowed down every August. <laughs> yeah, that's true. <laughs> so, that's true. <laughs> um, you, you just have to plan for that. So I think doing good good handovers, being up to date with when your team members are going to be off on holiday and not scheduling work for when they're going to be not around. And also encouraging people to take time off because 100%. this is not, you know, this kind of, let's just get everything delivered. My boss has asked me for it, so I'm just going to say yes. I mean, having worked in the healthcare sector on legal projects, there are some situations where you do just have to say yes and you put your life on hold and you yeah. work 12 hour days and you get things done and that's the job. But there's often many projects where you have a lot more management discretion about how you and your team implement the work. And I think it's really important that we look after our people. Fantastic. And look, if, you, if anyone's got any last minute questions and hopefully, uh, Yanara, you can hear now. Uh, it, it's hopefully working. I, I, I can certainly hear it. If anyone's got any last minute questions for Elizabeth, now's the time to put them. But um, what I was going to say, Elizabeth, is tell us, in your view, when, when is it time to stop a project? When is it time to say no? Just, this is it. I, w I can't answer that question, but you remember we talked about five actionable steps. Yes, we only talked yes. about one and then we got sidetracked. Oh, we did too, yes. Let's <laughs> so look. if anybody's well, been taking notes <laughs> and you've got bullet bullet, right. shall I just quickly whiz through the other four? Let's, or do you want to let's do that? that. No, let's do the five actionable steps. Let's remind ourselves. Go for it. Okay, so one was we talk to the client. Two is we look at the scope, revise the scope. What is in scope? Do we need all right. of that stuff? How can yeah. we um, address what we've got and make a plan to deliver that? So yeah. requirements documentation will help there. Yeah. Then update your project schedule. So you need to create a new realistic project schedule covering all of the things that we talked about earlier and engaging people, making sure that you're really confident and it's got enough contingency so that you can deliver the work. Yeah. Um, look at any project risks that are still open. So that would be number four. What project risks have we got? Perhaps we weren't looking at them properly last time. Are there mm -hmm. things that still might come and um, cause disruption later? So that will help. And then five is just engaging the team, which is the final step in my five steps, uh, but actually something that you'd be doing the whole way through. And I know we've talked a lot about working with other people, so I won't labour that point. Mm. What, what You talked about those project risks. What, 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 what typically can people be looking out for? Well, being able to uh, f prove that you're effectively managing risk is a great way to increase stakeholder confidence. Because if you can say, we've looked at all of these things and certain issues are being addressed and certain risks are not being addressed, we're going to put management plans in place so that if they do happen, then we can deal with it. Um, so typical project risks are things like lack of resources, supplier going out of business, not having the te technology solution, not having enough time to do proper testing, Mm -hmm. I mean, it, it, look through what's on the risk register because hopefully there is one. And if there isn't, you need to be starting one from scratch, looking at all the things that could potentially cause problems later. Because ideally, if you've got a good, robust management plan for those risks, even if it costs a bit of money, you can be much more prepared to hit your timescales. I mean, this is working, all the things I talk about are working in a predictive environment because I don't have any hands-on agile experience. Not enough to write home about anyway. So I know risk management and scheduling is slightly different in the agile world but broadly i think those five steps would go across all types of project methodology now we i, I said i don't know who this is because it's frustrating why it doesn't come up with a person but anyway hopefully uh, hopefully this is a this is a great point unrealistic schedules are, are a serious project risk and need to be elevated in the risk review as part of the project go no go decisions i mean do you see that um do you see that as you said as a someone coming into a new program or starting a new project that, that, that they should ensure that that's in place straight away? Oh, yes. Um, definitely you need a project 
uh, risk. Schedule risk is huge and also relatively easy to address if you've got some sensible approaches to creating schedules. Yeah. And um, go no go decisions. I'm so glad that person brought that up yeah, because that, up, yeah. that was a that was a key thing for me on many of the projects that we did. We had basically a gate that said, do we go? Do we not go? What are our criteria? If we mm -hmm. hit these criteria, we move forward. And it's, it came up on one of my um, calls with a mentoring client last week, I think, because it's such an easy to implement governance framework that yeah. allows you to just say, what's the risk about this? Shall we do it? Should we not? And then it, everybody's really clear and it's very transparent. Fantastic. We got, I'm going to, before we go on that project, uh, stop one. Go on, Bianca's asked this one. Do you have suggestions on how to influence teams to increase their utilization on projects? So <laughs> there's quite a lot to unpick there, Bianca. Um, why are they not fully, do you mean fully utilized as in they, they're going to donate more of their time to you? Or are they just inefficient workers and they take ages to do their work? So if we assume that we want to influence the teams so that they spend more time on our projects, then I think it's a lot to do with understanding what their other priorities are. Because for all we think our projects are really important and it's the most important thing in the world to us to get this stuff done. Actually, in the grand scheme of things, somebody has to work on the low priority projects across the organization, and that might be you. So there might be team members who are in a matrix structure and they are working on other projects that are actually higher priority than your work. So understanding their other priorities can help you be realistic about how much time you can get, talking to their line managers, making sure they're very clear, treating them like nice people who want to work with you because you're the fun, exciting project, trying to you know, make it easy for them to, um, to engage and to yeah. enjoy the work that they have. And also making sure that they draw a direct line between their contribution to the project and the overall goal. And if they can make that connection, that's a really powerful way to help people see why their work matters. And I think when people understand that why, they are far more likely to, to show up with their best self to contribute to the project. Brilliant. Bianca, hopefully that was uh, helpful for you. You can take that back this afternoon and uh, make it happen <laughs> or Monday. Um, Elizabeth, let's just talk, let's just finish off on that, that stopping the project. So let's just come back to that if that's okay. So tell me this, you know, when, when to stop a project? Walk us through what normally happens and, and perhaps the signs as well. I think often it starts with somebody saying, you know, we've spent a lot of money on this. <laughs> yeah. Are we genuinely going to carry on? How close are we? It seems like it's a failing project. What are we actually going to get at the end of it? And then you've got that, that decision to take, which is, do we continue to throw money at the problem and invest in the project and hope that things get better? and deliver because we're too proud to say well, you have to stop because we don't want to be associated with failure or do you actually say it's time to call it a day and I think the the better leaders are happy to make that decision and are happy to decide on the option that is stop and that could happen when a project doesn't align with the organization's goals anymore so say yes. you've done a project and it's a year long but halfway through that year the CEO changes and says the direction of the company is totally different now we're not going to invest in this we're we're changing all of our procedures to do something else and your project doesn't fit so it would be stupid to continue to deliver it so mm. it's just better to cut your losses and stop see what you can salvage and let everybody get on with something that does actually contribute to the strategic objectives i mean i, I hear this all the time and you know as you, exactly as you said there the organization's changed the leadership's changed but they've still got the vendor or uh, uh, you know, outsourced uh, consultancy that's spending millions on delivering something, but uh, you know the project managers are saying it, it, it's 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 going to fail. Um, you know, but perhaps those those uh, decisions are taken out of their hands. Unfortunately, um, I think often they are taken out of their hands, and it can be mm. so demoralising working on a project you know is not going to deliver the benefit that it could do. Yes. So that's yeah. a shame. And I think good project managers leave because of that, because who wants to spend another six months delivering something and everyone's going to go, great, you hit all the project milestones and you delivered on time, but we don't want it. <laughs> What's the point? We want to be involved with transformative change. We want to be helping people and make, knowing that our, dif our actions make a difference in the world. Um, so that's one thing. Maybe the whole organization has changed, but maybe the project yes. is just no longer capable of meeting the original business case for whatever reason, you've reduced the scope so much that it's pointless or you're so far over budget that you can't recover and it outweighs the business benefit. So there's just no point in carrying on. That can be a harder decision to take, but still a worthwhile discussion to have. Um, um, or you could, 
sorry, go ahead. Oh, no, sorry, you go. I would say the other common reason of those, of, of the three, would be not yeah. having enough of the right people to be able to see it through to the end for whatever reason. So maybe a key resource has left and you can't replace yeah. them. You might not want to cancel the whole project, but you might want to postpone it until you can put the right resources in place to carry it through successfully. Fantastic. Elizabeth, thanks for answering so many questions there. And, you know, we're juggling between looking at the comments, so it's uh, appreciated. Uh, look, if Pete, I know you've got some wonderful books, as you just alluded to there. You've got one coming out. What's what's the best book that people should be looking out for? Where can they get it? What's your courses that are coming up? How can people engage with you? I think the the best book at the moment will be the one I've been talking about today, Engaging Stakeholders. Did he Engaging Stakeholders on Projects? It's published by APM and it's available on Amazon. And um, we'll stick a link courses. up. We'll stick a link up so people can grab oh, okay. it. Okay. Thanks very much. Yeah. Um, training courses at the moment. I'm just coming to the end of one. I'm managing multiple projects, but you can find out about that at girlsguidespm.com forward slash MMP. And Fantastic. learn more about that course and when it's next available. We will put that in there as well. And look, there's been some amazing little nuggets of gold there that people can take away. And I'm sure people have found that very useful. I hope everyone has found that useful. Elizabeth, thanks for joining us. We will uh, make this video downloadable. Uh, you can watch back and uh, enjoy this. Um, and uh, Elizabeth, thank you so much for joining me. You're um, very welcome. Thank you for having I'm, me. You're welcome. I'm sure we'll have you on again because it was really great to take some advice. And I know lots of project managers will benefit from your insight. So have a great uh, weekend thank and uh, we shall see you soon. Thank you very much. Right, Elizabeth, thank you for Elizabeth joining. I hope you really enjoyed that um, LinkedIn Live. Uh, we'll have more of those coming up. We've got a fantastic one coming up in a few weeks time, uh, all about sleep. So um, uh, how, how sleep and performance helps you and your team, but also can help you personally and, and for you and your family. So look out for that. Um, we'll have this uh, up on our blog on Monday and we'll send you all a copy of the link. Have a lovely weekend and thanks for joining. I really appreciate your time.